You've just uh, enjoyed a, a, an ice cream, I a local ice cream. Ice cream. I, it's, I, I, the, it's called Orkney ice cream, and it's a, it seems kind of interesting that it's uh, it's sold here on the borders. You could not probably in Scottish towns be further from the Orkneys than you could at, at Melrose uh, on the Tweed. But uh, it, it, beautiful ice cream. Of course, seeing you with an ice cream cone memories yeah. go back to comfort and joy twenty five yeah. years ago. Hard to believe. Twenty five. Yeah, we had a a, a screening. They had a nice. Uh, Special screening in Glasgow uh, earlier in this year, in February of this year. And uh, also Claire Grogan was there, who, who's here at the festival with me, or with us. Mm. Uh, and uh, we, had a, we had a great night talking about it, because Comfort of Joy was, at the time when it came out, it was, you know, it wasn't the most, it was the least successful of Bill's three trilogy films of, you know, Gregory's Girl, uh, Local Hero. And then Comfort of Joy was the least successful. But interestingly enough, now it's, it's sort of become a bit of a, a cult film. It becomes the film that people say, oh, that, and we always liked it. But I'm not sure they, everybody liked it completely at the time. You know, it was quite controversial because of the ice cream, uh, you know, the coincidence of the, the battle, the ice cream deaths that happened in Glasgow. And, yeah, very, very much a topical subject. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a great time to launch a light-hearted yeah. look at the ice cream business in Glasgow. I'm thinking back to the, the film itself. You mentioned there the two earlier Bill Forsyth films. Yeah. Now, you didn't appear in, in those two. You had the, the, the chance to, to yeah. appear in those. But the, the 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 concept behind the film is very interesting. You play a commercial radio DJ. Mm-hmm. Your girlfriend, Maddie, is a thief. Uh, she, quite early on in the film, decides that enough is enough and leaves you in the lurch around about Christmas time, taken from Good Tidings of Comfort and Joy, the, yeah. the, the title. And you seem to go into this spiral where you almost reach a midlife crisis before we're a quarter of the way into the film. Yeah, well, it, in, you know, there is an autobiographical element in this because Bill had experienced something very similar. And um, at the time, I, I, I always thought there was a, something a little bit autobiographical about it for Bill. I mean, people, very often writers write from what they know and what they, they feel closest to. Uh, but of the three films that uh, of the, that were mentioned, it was the closest to uh, to Bill's everyday life. And since then, of course, it has been largely almost prophetic because Bill, his preoccupation in Comfort and Joy was being what it's like being very successful as, as a DJ was and, uh, locally, known by everybody and kind of loved and liked as Dickie Bird. Uh, but but being popular and successful, but while your own life or your personal life has literally fallen down around your ears and uh, loneliness and great gulfs and voids in your life have opened up. And uh, that's what he was touching on. And that's, you know, that's, I think that's what stuck, stuck well with it and, and has given it the, the, the legs to survive longer. Certainly, I remember several scenes in the film where you really had to wear an expression of, of someone who was concerned that they may have left the gas on at home. It has a good, that's a nice way of putting it. Yes, I did. It was always that feeling of, what have I done? Where am I going? Why am I doing this? Is it all going to work out? Um, yeah, it, it was a lovely part to play. It was very, very consuming. It was one of these parts which, uh, you know, you can kind of do when you're a bit younger, that you're up every day and every shot and every day. I don't think there would be many scenes in Comfort and Joy that that that, uh, that I wasn't in. To be absolutely honest, I was surprised if there were any. Now, as well as the, the images of, of your concerned expression, there's the red BMW convertible car. Mm. And I think I understand that the, the time you actually couldn't drive. Yeah, I didn't drive. You see, what, what is it? the other two films I, I couldn't do for two or three reasons. I won't be boring now and years ago to go into but when Bill sent the script of Comfort and Joy, when Bill Forsyth sent it to me, I uh, I read it and I thought, well, this is wonderful, this is a fabulous script for me. How oh, wonderful that he's thought of me to do it. And then I realised that it was as much about a man's relationship with his BMW as with anything else, as uh, as every part of it seemed to involve either the girlfriend or the car or the DJ. And uh, And I, of course, did not drive a car. And so I said to Bill... You know, Bill, it might be that this might be another one I'm going to have to miss because I can't drive. And Bill said, um, "Well, can you pretend you can drive?" I said, "Well, yeah, I said, I can get a car along the road, you know, but I'll never, I won't pass a test between now and the day you're opening to start shooting the film." So, well, he said, "Well, we'll just pretend." 
Just pretend you can drive. And so I drove all the way through that film with a very famous cameraman, Chris Menges, uh, strapped to the bonnet of this car, sometimes hanging off the roof, looking in and, or on the side, at reasonable speeds through Glasgow traffic in the midwinter Russia without having any licence or insurance. It's not something I would recommend or <laughs> I don't think it would be possible anymore. But I used to, be, I used to wait at, uh, at junctions ready to, to drive off, being shepherded by police officers standing beside me saying, right, Mr. Patterson, we'll just, we'll just get in clearance. Uh, we're just closing the slip road for the M8 off uh, at Kingston Bridge and uh, we'll, we'll give you a call. Nice night tonight, Mr. Patterson. And I said, if these guys just ask me, do you have a licence, Mr. Patterson? I wouldn't be able to answer yes. So that's it. It was close to the wind. In, in the film, there's, there's a, a scene of you driving and, of course, there's Dyer Street's private investigations yeah. theme, the instrumental mm-hmm. playing as, as well at the time. And this is the point in the film where you, you've decided that as a radio DJ at that time, you, you were not particularly satisfied with presenting the programme. You wanted to go out and become an investigative journalist. I wanted journalist. to do serious things. I'm a serious person and I want to do serious things. And you had stumbled over this war. Your car had been damaged yeah. in an attack. That then was essentially the, the turning point because you began to get a, a sniff of something quite significant happening. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, and he, whether he was going to manufacture something serious or whether he luckily landed on what he thought was serious. So that, that was essentially... That was the plot that drove it on, um, and as we say, the the you know the story. I think the angle of of, a, of an ice cream war. There was enough. There's enough truth in that in any kind of patch of people looking after their patches in any business, and there was enough of that. But you know what worked against the film when it came out was the reality that there had been a yeah very little to do with ice cream and a lot to do with uh, drugs. Uh, um, families at, at war uh, in, a, uh, in the east of the city. And this had led to you know, a fire bombing of a fire starting in a house with, with deaths of, of some people. That, so it, it coloured the film and, uh, and, and uh, didn't help it at the beginning. But it was certainly not Bill, and Bill Forsyth's intention to be facetious about that. This, the, the news of that, that happened after after the film was released. Um, you, you have recently published a book which looks at life growing up in Glasgow in the, the 1950s and very much about your own experiences growing up in, in the city. I mean, when did you feel the time was right to pen such a book? Well, I didn't pen it as a book, you see. I, 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 the, the story behind it, which I talk about at, at any, thing, any discussions I've ever done on the book at various festivals or, or even the preface, is that I... I wanted to write something that uh, I could hear other people doing, uh, using my words. Instead of being so used to being an actor who who wrecks other people's words over the years, I wanted to hear my words being used. And so I sent the story that I wrote. I wrote a little story that just was a memory of childhood that came back one evening or one day to me. I thought, well, I'll write that. And I'll write it as, a, as an afternoon story for radio. So I sent it to BBC Radio 4, I think it was, and uh, under a false name, uh, thinking that if they picked it up, somebody else will record it and I'll hear it. But they wrote back to the false name to say that they liked it and they, they were thinking of uh, you know, broadcasting it and they would like to ask the actor Bill Patterson to read it. So suddenly I, well, well, you know, I could have said, well, I won't have Patterson anywhere near it. But the, um, the, uh, I ended up admitting to it. So they were happier to have written and read almost. So I, that then led to a commission to write more for radio. Took me a long time. And I'm not a you know, natural writer sitting down writing. So it, it, um, it was only when they were being broadcast that people were going into bookshops and saying, we've been hearing this on the radio. Is it, uh, is it available? You know, can we buy the book? And the same, well, there's no book. So the publishers came to me and said, you know, about those radio stories, can we publish them? 